This week begins our um, Women of Faith series, uh, four weeks. Um, I try and do this every year. Um, This year I am doing Methodist Women of Faith. All of the women that I will be talking to you about have some connection to the Methodist Church. And uh, we are going to start with somebody who I have already talked about. And um, I know you think that maybe that scripture was very interesting this morning. Quite a story. I'm going to get to that in just a minute, I promise. And that is not at all the direction that this sermon is going to go in. But it does fit with the story of Fanny Crosby. Um, I am going to rattle through a lot of information because I just think there was so much neat stuff. And I'm a history guy. But at the end, we're going to talk about how she can relate to you. And you're going to be thinking as we go along, there is no way that I can relate to this person. There's no way that this person can be somebody who, I don't have that kind of gift, I don't have that kind of talent. But we're going to talk about something entirely different that she has done, several things that she has done in her life. So, Fanny Crosby um, is a hymn writer. Uh, uh, If you pay attention, you will notice that our prelude and our postlude and our opening hymn and our sending hymn are all hymns written by Fanny Crosby. Now, she is a poetess. She writes the words for hymns. She has one hymn where she wrote both the words and the music. I read about it in her autobiography, but I could not find it anywhere. So it can't be that good of a hymn. So she is really mainly known for writing words. She was born in 1820. Um, She died in 1915. She was 94 years old, almost 95 years old, when she passed away. Um, She was born in Brewster, New York. Uh, That's about 50 miles north of New York City. Um, At the age of six weeks, she lost her sight. So at six weeks old, she had an infection as a baby, and the regular doctor from town was not in. And there was a traveling doctor who was traveling through And so that family called him because they were afraid Fanny was going to pass away from this infection that she had. It included her eyes, and he put a hot poultice on her eyes, and whatever was in there burnt not just the outside of her eyes, but permanently permanently damaged her eyes, and she was blind from that point forward. She could distinguish between light and dark, But that was it. And so uh, the picture that we have of her on the board is usually how you found Fanny Crosby. She she was alive before the white cane was a symbol of the blind. And so wearing dark glasses was a symbol that a person was blind. And so she went around usually wearing dark glasses for most of her adult life. Um... Her father passed away before she was a year old. So her mother was forced to work to take care of her and her siblings. And so Fanny spent a lot of time with her maternal grandmother. Um, Her infancy, up up until about the age of 10, she lived, uh, she lived, spent much of her time with her maternal grandmother. And her maternal grandmother was somebody who believed that every child should pull her own, his or her own weight. And so she never treated Fanny like she was blind. She always expected her to be able to do things. Um, So they taught her chores around the home. She had chores just like her her sisters did. She wasn't able to attend school, a normal school. So while her siblings were in school, her grandmother 
would take her on long walks and they would talk about nature and about God and about the age of five, her grandmother began to teach her the Bible. Um, Fanny memorized a lot of the Bible. By the time she was an adult, she had memorized the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. She had uh, memorized all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of Proverbs, all of the Song of Solomon, and most of the Psalms, and then many other verses throughout the Bible. Um, she once said to somebody, if I want to read the Bible, I just press a button in my mind and the Bible opens up and I just read the passage to myself. That, I think, gives you a little picture into the kind of mind that she had. So, at eight years old, we have what we believe to be her first poem that was written down. And I'm going to read that for you. Um, oh, what a happy soul I am, although I cannot see. I am resolved in this world, contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. Kind of gives you a, a mindset for who Fanny Crosby was. At the age of 10, her mother got a job in another town and uh, moved away. Um, her sisters stayed with her grandmother, but Fanny um, moved with her mother to this new job. Um, her mother was domestic help, so cleaned and cooked and, and did all of those things for uh, a, a client, Mrs. Hawley. Mrs. Hawley was the other person who was instrumental in Fanny learning about the Bible. Um, Mrs. Hawley tried to make Fanny learn five new chapters every day and would drill her on memorization of the Bible. Five chapters. I can't imagine five sentences, let alone five chapters in a... In a so, she had very structured people in her lives. And Mrs. Hawley is the reason why we had that unique scripture about Ananias and Sapphira. So Mrs. Hawley was, of course, wealthy. She had domestic servants, uh, more than one. Uh, Fanny's mother was just one of her staff. And Mrs. Hawley took up uh, the cause of educating Fanny. And Fanny um, spent a lot of hours with Mrs. Hawley. And Mrs. Hawley had a beautiful rose garden. So she would take Fanny through the rose garden and she would describe each flower to Fanny. And Fanny could distinguish types of roses. By the time she was 10 or 11 years old, she could distinguish what type of rose it was by how it smelled. And so in this rose garden, there were many varieties of roses, but there was one rose bush that she was not allowed to pick a flower from. It was a particular white rose. I should know what type it is, but I don't. And um, Fanny had friends from town, other girls uh, her age, and they would play together. And Fanny was allowed to pick roses from any other rose bush except for this one white rose bush in the center of the rose garden. And one day, a friend of her, hers and her, were walking in the garden, and she said, Fanny, Fanny, please, can I have one of those white ones? No one's looking. Can you please cut me one? And so Fanny Crosby went over to the, as it were, forbidden fruit of the garden and clipped one of the right white roses. But unbeknownst to her, Mrs. Hawley was in the window of the house watching her as she did it. And so after the girl had left and Fanny was left, Mrs. Hawley brought her in and read the scripture that I had 
to her as an 11-year-old little girl. And she said, I never lied again to Mrs. Holly. I don't know if she lied to other people, but um, uh, Fanny was a unique individual. Um, I said she didn't have an education, but that's not true. At the age of 15, a new school opened in New York City. It was called the New York School for the Blind. She was one of the first students to attend the New York School of the Blind. She went at the age of 15. She attended school for eight years, so she attended school until she was 23. Um, during that time, um, the gift that she had for, for, for putting words together into poetry was fine-tuned. But not without a few bumps in the road. At the age of 16, she was um, working on all of the classes that you would think that students would work on, reading and writing and arithmetic. And um, she was great at history. She was, she was excellent at English and writing, but she hated arithmetic. Um, she had a friend who was very good in arithmetic, another blind girl who was helping her. She had learned addition and she had learned subtraction. And her friend was trying to teach her multiplication. And she just couldn't get her times tables down. And so the head of the school came to Fanny one day and said to her, we notice that your grades are slipping. We think you're spending too much time writing poetry, and so we want you to stop so that you can learn arithmetic. And she was forced to stop writing poetry, which made her grades tank. Um, she did even worse in school. The head of the school after she learned her times tables, which she did eventually learn, allowed her to go back to writing poetry because her friend, who was good in math, told him, there is no way she's going to learn division. You need to stop now. And so Fanny Crosby knows addition and subtraction and multiplication, but doesn't really know how to do division and isn't very good at arithmetic. And the first thing she wrote after she was done, was this poem. <laughs> I loathe a bore, it makes me sick to hear the word arithmetic. That was the first poem she wrote after she was allowed to write poetry. That kind of gives you a sense of who Fanny was. So, like I said, she spent eight years as a student, two years as a teacher, that line kind of blurs because the older students help the younger students. Um, she never learned how to use Braille, although Braille was part of the curriculum for the School of the Blind in New York at that early time. They had an early form of Braille. She said it confused her, and it was hard for her brain to distinguish the different types of Braille. Um, but she worked really hard, she was extremely intelligent, and she helped people with uh, English and with writing all through her school career. And for the last two years she was at the School for the Blind, she was a teacher. While she was a teacher, a young man and his brother joined the school staff. Her, her, the, the brother was brought on to be a history instructor, uh, the younger boy um, was not old enough to be a teacher. He was only 16 years old at the time. Um, he, his, their parents had passed away. Tragically, they were orphaned, and they needed a place, and his brother got a job at the School for the Blind, so uh, the school hired him as a secretary, and he was so impressed with Fanny Crosby that he offered to write down her poems. You see, Fanny never learned to write her poems down. She always dictated her poems to other people. 
And this young man was one of the first people that she hired to dictate her poems. You might know him. His name's Grover Cleveland, later to become the president of the United States. Um, it was the first president that she met, but not the last. She didn't know at the time that he was going to be president. Uh, she campaigned for Grover later uh, in his career, wrote him poems for on the campaign. So she was always connected with politically influential people because of her gift. Her poetry was put into four different books. She was published. Uh, she was a published author before she even wrote hymns. She had four published books of her poetry. And um, people asked her to write poems for different events. She wrote poems uh, for the Union during the Civil War. Um, she's not very proud of it because um, she asked for uh, people in the South to be killed. She, she specifically wrote about Jefferson Davis a lot because she could rhyme, rhyme a lot of things with Jefferson Davis. Um, so this career of hers paid for her way, but it wasn't until she was in her late 20s that she had a conversion moment. She had learned all of this Bible, and she believed that she believed in God, but one of the things that her grandmother always told her was, you have to know the exact date and the exact time that you've had your conversion moment to be truly saved. And she worried about that because her grandmother, one of the last things her grandmother said to her before she died was, I want to see you in heaven. And Fanny's response was, God willing, I'll see you there. And so Fanny had a conversion moment later in her life. And at that point, she began to write hymns. Fanny was a prolific hymn writer. Um, she wrote... 5,959 hymns for Bigelow and Maine, published under, under over 200 different names. Bigelow and Maine said to her, we can't publish a book with all only Fanny Crosby hymns. We need other people to write for it. And so she used other names. Um, just a few of the 204 different names that I found um, Maud Marion was one of them, her maid Marion. Uh, she thought that was funny. Um, Mrs. Kate Grimley, um, C.M. Wilson, C.M. Wilson, C.M. Wilson, uh, and uh, Grace J. Francis. I just thought that one was a good one. But 200 different pen names, men and women. So she has three hymn, three hymn books that were published they had different authors in them, but all the hymns were written by Fanny Crosby for Bigelow in Maine. That was not the only place that she worked for. She got paid $1 or $2 for every hymn that she wrote. That was it. So after she wrote it, she turned it in. She would get a paid a dollar or $2 depending on what year she wrote it. And that was it. She never got any royalties or anything else. She didn't want any royalties. She wanted her hymns to be used in churches and in Sunday schools and in revivals. That was more important than her getting royalties. And so she would do that. Um, some of the tunes that you may know, some of them are the ones that we're doing today. Uh, blessed Assurance, To God Be the Glory, I Am Thine, O Lord, Rescue the Perishing, Safe in the Arms of Jesus. Um, Safe in the Arms of Jesus is an is a, is a interesting one. Um, she would usually just write poetry for hymns, but occasionally... A composer would come to her and would play her a song. And so um, her friend William Doan came to the door one day of her apartment in New York City 
And he said, I have to catch a train in 45 minutes, but I want to hum you a song. And so he hummed her what would later become safe in the arms of Jesus. And she said, how long do you have? And he said, I have to leave in 40 minutes. And she said, stay right here. That's safe in the arms of Jesus. So she went into her bedroom in her apartment. She got on her knees and prayed. And she wrote, safe in the arms of Jesus. She went out, had time to dictate it to William Doan, and he still caught his train on time. It is amazing to me that a song that we sing like that, and that wasn't the only time she did that. She did that with, um, I think it's Phoebe, who, uh, who wrote the, the, the music for Blessed Assurance, and Phoebe played that for her, and, and she said to Phoebe that day, that's Blessed Assurance, and they wrote it in 30 or 40 minutes. She did this over and over and over again. She was, uh, like I said, active in politics. She was the first woman to ever speak to the U.S. Senate, um, she spoke to them for the cause of education of the blind. And so she was... Uh, she also had other skills that she had learned as a child. So uh, during the Civil War, there was a call for people to make mittens for the soldiers because it was so cold. And so her and the girls from the New York School for the Blind, made 5,000 pairs of mittens for soldiers in just six weeks so they could be sent to the soldiers on the front. She used everything that she had for the glory of God. And you may say, but pastor, I don't have a gift like that. I can't write a hymn in 20 minutes. But I want to say to you that that wasn't her only gift. So at about the age of 80, she had a heart attack. She was living in New York City on her own all the way to the age of 80. She had been married, but her and her husband lived apart. Um, he passed away in 1902, which was just after her heart attack. But after her heart attack, she moved to Bridgeport, Connecticut to live with her sister. She didn't want to move there, but her sister was afraid for her to be alone. And so Fanny said, yes, I'll go to Bridgeport. You have to allow me to continue to do my work. She was a uh, speaker. Uh, she was a... After the age of 60, she kind of had an epiphany, and she had begun to work with the poor. And so when she got to Bridgeport, Connecticut... And she started attending church. She tried to figure out from the church community how the city of Bridgeport was helping the poor and homeless of that city. And what she found out was that there was no help for the poor and the needy. It was very little. And she was upset, and so she began to work. The thing is, Fanny never stopped moving forward. She always had a plan or a goal or a job that she thinks needed to be done. And I know there are some of you who are wondering, how is it that this relates to me? And I think this is it. She took those things that she was passionate about. Hymn writing, helping others, um, whether it be while she was a teacher at the School for the Blind, whether it be when she was uh, serving meals to the homeless, whether it be when she was living in her apartment in New York City and helping the neighborhood kids around her to make sure that they had meals to eat. She did work for God wherever she was at. And I think that's the most remarkable thing about Fanny Crosby. The hymn writing is great, and I enjoy singing her hymns. But even if she didn't write a single hymn, the lives that she affected where they were. 
was much more important, I think, than even all the hymns. One last Fanny Crosby story. So, um, To God Be the Glory is one of her hymns. It, uh, it became popular not until the 20th century. In fact, it was the Billy Graham crusade that made it popular. Billy Graham had taken his crusade from here in the United States over to England, and things weren't going well. And the person who was in charge of his music was going through some local hymn books there in England, hoping to find a hymn that the English people knew, and he came across this hymn that was not titled To God Be the Glory. It had a different title entirely. But when he played it and when he sang it, he thought it was lovely, and so he went to Billy Graham, and Billy Graham was so upset that things weren't going well that he trusted the person who was in charge of his music, and he said, okay, if you think it's important, we'll use it. And it was one of the songs, one of the hymns, that turned around the crusade in England. And to God be the glory, came back to the United States with the Billy Graham Crusades and became a popular hymn that we still sing today. And it was just a forgotten hymn in a book, in a pile in England, that somebody happened to be going through and found. So you never know what it is that you're going to do that is going to change the world for God. Will you pray with me? God of grace and mercy, thank you. Thank you for the women of faith in our world who help us to see your glory. Help us to be more like them each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen.
difference in your world today. Amen.